I'll just open up quickly in prayer. Father, we just bless you and we honor you. And we just say you're a good, good father. You're a good, good father. And Lord, we just thank you for your presence that's already here. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you never leave us on this journey. You're always with us. You're always speaking to us. You're always searching after us, Lord. You're always leaving the 99 to come after our one heart. And Lord, we just honor you and we thank you, God, that tonight lives will be changed, hearts will be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, we're talking about honoring father and mother. And I have to kind of chuckle because, you know, we got a chance to choose what topic we wanted. And I just jumped at this one. And then I was like, well, I can't find no teaching on it. <laughs> like, I couldn't find a historical teaching on this. And even in the book, Transformation of the Inner Man, there's not one chapter that's just for honoring your mother and father. And I was like, man, I got set up. <laughs> So, you know, I was like, Easter, is there something in the office? You know, so she, she shared some things with me. But as I've been preparing this, I, I really actually just feel like the Lord needed me to, to do some digging on my own. And um, every week that we gather for this teaching, I, I just get this sense that there's like a decoding happening, like an unraveling, a, a piecing together where Holy Spirit is just every week giving us keys to the places in our heart that might have been hidden. And so this evening, it's a privilege to share on honoring your father and mother. Um, this subject is pretty close to my heart. I have a great relationship with my parents. <laughs> um, I'm also a returning prodigal, so I didn't always have a great relationship with my parents. <laughs> but I always loved them, and I always knew that I was loved by them. And I'm a daddy's girl to the core. <laughs> Even as an adult, some people may say I'm spoiled, but don't listen to them. <laughs> but I, I know what it means to have challenges in life and, and how our childhood can impact our relationship that we have with our parents, the relationship that we have with authority, and most important, the relationship that we have with the Lord. I also recognize that we all come to this topic in a different place. We're, we're all in a different place with this, this particular topic, depending on where you are with your parents, whether your parents are here or not, still in the physical and the natural. And so I don't take it lightly to, to share this tonight. Um, but I do know that wherever you are in your heart tonight, when you leave here, you're going to leave here in a new place of freedom, a new place of healing, and a hope in the Jesus that loves us so very much. So let's take a look at the first scripture, Exodus 20:12. It really is the foundational scripture for this teaching, honor your father and mother. Then you will live a long life, a full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. In this scripture, we see that life is connected to honor. I love this quote from Bill Johnson. Giving honor actually releases the life of God into a situation. Giving honor actually releases the life of God into a situation. And I love this because it really is just a description of what Jesus did as he walked along the earth. When there were people in different situations, and we even ourselves would read it and say, how in the world would this person be honored? How does this person even deserve to be honored? Jesus would come into the mix and turn their shame into honor. Do you remember the woman who was caught in adultery? In John chapter 8, verse 3 through 11, that's small. So, let me give you the remix. You have this woman who was clearly wrong in her actions. And the Pharisees were trying to shame her, but they were also trying to test Jesus. 
Jesus does not even acknowledge the allegations. Instead, he addresses those who were pointing the finger as he began to write into the sand. What was the end result? She was left alone with Jesus. She is left with forgiveness. She is left encountering life himself. And why do I bring this up? Because when we're talking about honoring your mother and father, it doesn't mean that they've done everything right. In fact, there might be times where it was just like this woman who was caught in adultery. It was pretty clear that the things that they did was wrong. So this leads me to point number one. Honoring your mother and father is not a suggestion. It is the fifth commandment. And according to Ephesians 6, 2, it is the first of the commandments that comes with a promise. And when I read that, I was like, I don't know that I read that before I actually understood it. But what they're saying is that when you look at Exodus 20, it begins to list the commandments. You should have no other God before me. Don't misuse the name of the Lord. And it goes on. But when it gets to the fifth commandment, he says, honor your mother and father. And the promise attached to it is that life will go well with you. So I looked up the word commandment for a definition, and I was so surprised that the definition referenced the Bible and the Ten Commandments. So I was like, wow. And so then I began to look at the synonyms that were attached to it, and they all have like this judicial theme. It's a directive. It's an edict. It's a decree. It's an order. It's something we are supposed to do. We don't have a choice in the matter. And then I just thought it was so odd that with it, they had this picture here of how this word has been used over time. So look how high it starts in 1800s. And then it goes all the way down to 2019. Not many people are using this word commandment anymore. However, we know that it doesn't matter how much a word is used. It doesn't change the weight or the importance that it carries. We don't get to choose what to obey in the word of God. So we see this commandment of honoring your mother and father and the blessings attached to it all throughout the Bible. Why is this so important to the Lord? Because God is invested in relationships. The first introduction to relationship that we have is with our parents. The way we respect and honor our parents says a lot about how we honor God, how we honor authority, and how we honor the people in our lives. In John 17, 3, in the Passion Translation, it says, eternal life means to know and experience you as the only true God and to know and experience Jesus Christ as the son whom you have sent. So I'm going to spend a quick moment here. This word know in the Greek means intimacy. It's literally the same word that was used in Matthew 125 where it says, and Joseph did not know Mary until she had her son. It also means to be sure. So, I was on a treadmill this morning, and I just have to laugh even when I was on the treadmill this morning, because I was like, I really think I need to write a book called, like, God Encounters While You Exercise, <laughs> or something. Like, so I'm worshiping, listening, running, you know, listening to the music, and a song came on, it just started to exalt the name of the Lord. Great is your name, Lord. You're marvelous. Your name is wonderful. Your name is beautiful. Your El Shaddai. And I just, I just started to, in my heart, because I didn't want to be too loud, but I'm like, Lord, I exalt your name. I exalt who you are. All the different names, I just started to exalt the name of the Lord. And then the Lord started to talk to me. <laughs> And I was a little surprised, <laughs> but I was surprised because of what he said. And he said, I want you to know me. 
I want you to know me. And so I was like, I know you, Lord. <laughs> I was like, I always want to know you more, but I know you. And I don't think he was playing around with me because he said it again. And this time he said, I want you to know me, Linnell. I'm not a man that I should lie. I'm not like anybody you know. When there are parts of your heart that are disappointed, parts of your heart that are angry, parts of your heart that doesn't trust me completely, I want you to know me there. I want you to know me in those parts of your heart. I, I just began to engage with the Lord. And what I realized was that when there's a part of my heart that's hardened, when there's a part of my heart that doesn't want to forgive, that part of my heart is responding to an experience that I've had with a human person. A human person who's flawed. But in turn, I actually treat the Lord that way. Even though he's not human man with flaw. And even, I, even though I don't say it, if I'm honest, that part of my heart that's disappointed believes that God didn't come through for me. Just like some human experience that I had. I began to cry. <laughs> It really didn't matter who was in the gym. I was really undone. And I said, Lord, I'm so sorry. I want to know you. I want to know you in every part of my heart. And I say this because I believe that we're commanded to honor our parents because regardless of the experience that we have with them, when we choose to honor them with our whole heart, it's so much easier to honor the Lord. <laughs> and this was just like a, kind of like a woe for me, like an aha moment. So, you know, as you're listening, you might be reminded of your part, a part of your heart that's sad or a part of your heart that's been disappointed or angry, or a part of your heart that's been abandoned. And I want you to know that the Lord is saying to you exactly what he said to me. I want to know you in that part of your heart. I want you to know me in that part of your heart. And so, Father, we just, in this even and now, Lord God, we just say, we want to know you. Not intellectually, not in our minds. We want to know you with our whole heart. Lord, we surrender those parts of our hearts that we've just been holding on to. Those parts of our hearts where we think that they're hidden from you, we surrender them to you, Lord. And Lord, we just say, give us a greater revelation of who you are in Jesus' name. So for the next point, the Sanfords, John and Paula, Paula, they, they're the ones who wrote the book. And so this is what they said. Our hidden and forgotten judgments against our fathers and mothers prevent us from seeing God. And so we have this slide here, and they call this the 2020 vision scripture. Whoever curses his mother or father his lamp shall be put out in complete darkness. That's Proverbs 20:20. 20, 20. I don't know if I've ever read that before, but the judgments that we make against our parents in our childhood can actually darken our spiritual eyes. So we don't see ourselves, we don't see others, or we don't see the Lord with 2020 vision. Now Paula and John, um, John they, they talk in, interactively in this book. And, you know, they tell different stories. And so Paula tells this story about when she was younger, her father, and she had a loving relationship with her father, but her father traveled a lot for work. She knew her dad loved her, 
she had a great relationship with him, but there was a part of her heart that was hidden that saw him as a weekend father, a weekend dad, because he was never around. So as a child, she didn't really believe that God would be there for her 24 hours a day, 365 days a week. Even though she knew all the scriptures about the Lord being near, she only felt close to God on the weekends when her father was home and they went to church. When she became an adult, she often did things where she felt like she needed to protect herself because she didn't really trust God. She didn't think that he could be trusted during the week. <laughs> Even when she got married, this didn't change. And that's just like a little plug. Like, just because you get married doesn't mean like your wounds go away. She had forgotten all about <laughs> the hidden resentment that she felt towards her dad, but her husband saw the fruit. And he suggested that she repent for any resentment that she might have had against her father, and she did. So one day she was driving a car, she had her, her husband was with her, and she fell asleep at the well. The car went into a ditch, and she could not figure out how to get out of it. She didn't know what to do. She just started to accelerate on the pedal, accelerate on the gas, and all of a sudden she was out of the ditch, and the car was on the road. And as soon as that happened, her husband woke up as well and looked at her and said, that was humbling. <laughs> and so this was her response. She began to weep and just cry out, oh my gosh, the Lord loves me. He loves me. He really loves me. She's an adult. She's been ministering and doing things, going along and traveling. And it was at this moment that she knew, not just with her mind, but with her whole heart, this was a new dimension of knowing. She had knew to some degree, but now she knows with a great assurance that God was with her, that he was defending her, that he was guiding her, that he was for her. And so what we see here is that it really doesn't matter what our mind has learned about the Lord. There are still parts of our heart that have been damaged and shaped by the interactions that we've had with our parents. And so that means that you can know all the scriptures, you can know the word, you, you can read them over and over again, but it may not penetrate your heart in that way if that part of your heart is still hidden. And so the judgment and the resentment that Paula had against her father actually formed an ungodly belief. Can we look at that slide? I missed this. Well, let me, re okay, yeah, let's go with it. Okay, all right. So listen, an ungodly belief, this is the perfect ungodly belief. It's one that appears to be absolutely true based on the facts of our experience, but yet it's absolutely false based on the word of God. So here's some examples. Nobody loves me. I'm all alone. God doesn't love me. I have to protect myself because God cannot be trusted. In red, I put most ungodly beliefs are not absolute. They're just a mixture of truth and error. And so if I could just pause here for a moment, when I was looking at this, I said to myself, this is what it means when it says, if you honor your mother and your father, it will go well with you. Because when we don't, look at the foolishness that we end up in. We end up in this place in our mind where we're believing these lies about ourselves. And so we can unknowingly believe this. And I think that that's the part that really got to me, that we can actually live our life based on this lie. And that means that 
you don't have the identity of a son or a daughter. But you don't even believe what the word of God says about you. And so I'm going to move on, but I just want to say that when you have an ungodly belief, you're actually in agreement with the devil. And, and that one kind of took me because, you know, we don't want to agree with the devil. <laughs> he got enough people agreeing with him. <laughs> we want to agree with what God says about us. So it's not enough to just say, yes, this is a lie. I know this is a lie. We have to come out of agreement with the lie and then say what the truth is. What does God's word say? <laughs> that he's never left me or forsake me. What, and so all of these things are attached to not honoring your mother and your father. And so Jesus came that we have life and life more abundantly. And so the root of the lie has to be addressed and destroyed so that the Lord can heal it. Until we're able to forgive our parents for the hurts that they may have caused in our hearts and repent for the judgments we have formed against them, we will not be able to truly see God for who he is. And I think now the scripture is the next one. Yes, okay. Psalms 119, 130. Break open your word within me until revelation light shines out. Those with open hearts are given insight into your plans. And then Matthew 5, 8 is the next one. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. When our hearts are purified, we come to understand and embrace God for who he actually is instead of what our experience may have projected onto him. In every area that we consciously or unconsciously judge or dishonor our parents, it is in that very area that life will not go well with us. So I'm going to tell you a story. When I was little, younger, teenage-ish, I would always like go to my mom and say, hey, mom, can I do this? Hey, can I go here? I want to, you know, such a nut, want to go here. Can I, can I go do that? Now, if I'm being honest, I know that I would ask my mom because I was scared my father was going to say no. And sometimes my mother would say, Linnell, go ask your father. <laughs> so after a couple of times, I thought to myself, my mother does not know how to make a decision for herself. Why do I have to go ask my father? Why can't she just, you know, tell me what the answer is? I judged her. I judged her. And that's not what was going on, but it was my perception of how she responded to me. And I have to tell you, I'll never forget the first time I went to a ministry session years ago with Easter. And, you know, they, you sit down and they say, tell me how, you know, how, how's your life with your parents? How was it when you were growing up? And, and I just start talking and talking. And I got to a point where I said, oh, no, my mom is great. She doesn't make good decisions, though. Like, she doesn't know how to make a decision on her own. She always got to depend on my father, right? And I just keep talking. So we go through the whole session, and we get to the part where now we're going to, you know, get some ministering done. And Easter, in the most loving voice, the most loving voice, she looks at me and she says, now, do you want to deal with this judgment that you have against your mother? <laughs> I said, oh, I didn't know that was a judgment, Right? I was literally like patting myself on the back because I was like, I, I, I'm good. But listen to this. What I realized that because of the law of bitter root was in place, I actually was not good at making decisions. I actually was in a place where I would never want to make a decision. People would say, well, what do you want to do? It, it could be something as easy as what do you want to eat? Whatever you want to do, I, I'm fine with that. Sometimes it would come to the point where I would end up doing nothing because I couldn't make a decision. And so 
because I didn't honor my mom in that area, life was not going well for me in that area. And so as we learn from bitter root judgments and inner vows, you know, I thought I was saying something good. I thought that it was good for me to be able to say that I'm going to make decisions on my own. But the law of saw, sowing and reaping was in place. And I had to address the judgment that I made. At the time, I would have never thought that I was dishonoring my mom in that way, you know? So I know we talked about, like, what does a judgment, how do I know if it's a judgment? And so let's look at this next slide. And I always remember hearing Pastor Peter say this. And he said, whenever we judge somebody, you know because it will take value away from that person. So this seesaw initially started out with one stone on one end and another stone on the other. But as you can see, the other side is all way down because, you know, Mr. Stone over here done through all of these judgments against this person, they can't even get up. And so when we are making a judgment, it's the attitude and the heart behind it. And it's also, does this person still have value? I think the way Pastor Peter used to say it is, you know, did the stock market go down in them? <laughs> you know, did they, did they lose the, 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 their worth? Has the worth gone down after you judge them? And so honor lifts a person up. This, this person can't get up. They're, they're weighed down with judgments. And so the next point is that honor actually reaps the blessing of impartation. And so I, I love this. It, it says this in the culture of honor. I think I put it on the next slide. Yes. Honor is accurately acknowledge, acknowledging who a person is. This helps us to receive the gift of who they are in our own lives. In other words, when I honor somebody for who they are, when I honor somebody for the way that God created it to be, I actually have access to be a recipient of what they carry. This is important because in a case where your parent may not have been good all the time, there may not have been areas that they operated in that were good. You may not have liked the way they treated you. But when this is the case, we need the eyes of the Jesus that's in us to say, how do you see my mom and dad? What was your original intent for their lives? What would a redeemed version of my mother and father look like? Once you're able to identify that, these are some of the things that you can use to honor them in your conversation. And that's whether they're still here or not. So let's go back to the example with my mom. One of the gifts that my mom carries is that she walks in such a grace and wisdom all hell could be breaking loose, and my mom will just have the right response, and it, whatever she says, I'll be like, how in the world does she do that? It just makes everything better. People just move into what they need to be doing. And so both her and my dad, they also throughout the years have modeled for me what it looks like to be a team in marriage, how to honor each other, how to defer to one another. And that's actually what she was doing when I was judging her. She was just deferring to my dad, but I was judging her for not knowing how to make a decision. When I judged my mom and I said that she doesn't know how to make a decision, until I renounced that judgment, I was not able to fully access the grace and the wisdom that she walks in in my own life. I have access to that. But I couldn't access it when I already had a judgment against her in that area. And so I, I love that because 
I was not able to receive the gift that she had inside of her until I broke the judgment against her. And this principle is a principle of honor that could be used with anyone. It's not just your parents. Anyone that's in authority over you, to be honest with you, it really is anyone. Because the thing about honor is that a lot of times when, we, the, when, it, when it's hard to give it is when it looks like it's not deserved, right? It's so easy to just honor someone when, when everything is going well. But when, when it looks like they shouldn't be honored, that's when it's difficult. That's when it's time to honor somebody. And so I love this because what it means is that essentially when we honor somebody, even if we think they don't deserve it, we actually give them permission to be who God has created them to be. And we get a chance to receive the qualities about them that's good. And so, you know, this, I, I love the thing about authority because even when I was thinking about this, some of us have been hurt in churches, in other churches, and in a spiritual setting. And because of that, even when we move on to a new place, we don't really honor and trust the authority at the place that we're at. And it's because we've been wounded. And we have to make sure that we look inside and say, you know, what judgments have I made against that person, regardless of whether or not what they did was wrong or right. Now, I'm not talking about spiritual abuse. You need to get out of there, right? We're, we're not talking about that. But when you're in a safe place, it is so good to honor your spiritual authority. You have access to what they have. You have access. You have, you're able to receive the impartation of what they carry. I think about Elijah and Elisha. May have mixed that up, you know, but I'm sure that Elijah didn't do everything right. I'm sure that there were so many things about him, but Elijah was able to receive that double portion because he honored him. And so lastly, I think we have the last slide, I think. Let's see. Yeah. So what if I don't think my, my parents deserve honor? Like, what if they don't deserve it? And if, if there's a situation with abuse, then of course you you would want to get out of that situation because you don't want to be in an unsafe environment. But however, in every situation, we can forgive. In every situation, regardless of whether we think someone deserves honor or not, we can forgive them. Regardless of what the situation is, we can pray for them. And regardless of what the situation is, we can show them the love of Jesus. So, we want to demonstrate the love of Christ through honor. And it can help heal our broken relationships and, our, and the broken places in our heart and also help us to grow. So that is the end. <laughs> Did you want to, okay, questions? Okay. I will try and answer your questions. <laughs> yes. Any questions? Good. So, Father, we just bless you and we honor you. Lord, thank you, God, for who you are. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you always come and meet us right where we are. And it's because you don't want us to stay the way we are, Lord. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for what you're doing in our hearts even today, Lord. Even this evening as we're listening to this, Father, I thank you what you're doing in our hearts, Lord. And Lord, I just say, um, you're such a gentleman, Holy Spirit. You're such a gentleman. And so I, I just thank you, Lord, for how you're, you're going to unveil and expose those places of our heart that has been hidden, those places of our heart where we've judged, even when we didn't know it. And Lord, I, I just thank you that it will go well with us. 
because we will make a choice to honor our authority, honor our mothers, and honor our fathers. And honor each other in Jesus' name.